Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Dwight David Eisenhower was born in Denison, Texas on October the 14th, 1890, the third of seven sons of David and Ida Eisenhower. Not long after Dwight's birth, the family moved to Abilene, Kansas, where he grew up. Dwight later attended West Point Military Academy, graduating in 1915, and soon after met Mamie Dowd, who would become the love of his life. The two would be married for over 50 years. Eisenhower rose to fame during World War II as the supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe, leading the successful D-Day invasion that played a significant role in the defeat of Nazi Germany. In 1952, he was elected the 34th President of the United States. Eisenhower's presidency focused on improving the nation's infrastructure and was also marked by efforts to contain the spread of communism during the Cold War, while maintaining peace and stability on the international stage. One of his initiatives was the creation of the People to People International Program, which he established in 1956 to improve understanding and friendship between citizens of different countries through educational, cultural, and humanitarian activities. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we'll be speaking with Mary Jean Eisenhower, youngest grandchild of Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower. Mary Jean will share her memories of playing as a child in the White House, spending personal moments with her grandparents, and meeting world leaders such as French President Charles de Gaulle and Premier of the Soviet Union Nikita Khrushchev. Mary Jean will also tell how an encounter with Khrushchev's son Sergei in the 1990s moved her to change careers in order to develop and expand People to People International, the program established by her grandfather. I'd now like to welcome Mary Jean Eisenhower to our show. Welcome, Mary Jean. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Well, I've been waiting quite a while to actually speak to you because I know you're very busy. You've been up to a lot of things. And I am so thankful because President Eisenhower, your grandfather, 34th president of the United States. I was born during his second term in office. And I don't remember him being in office, but I remember when he died back in 1969. And I had been studying presidents a lot back then. I read all about them and I knew he was sick and I saw him on the news. And then I remember hearing that he died. And I remember that I cried. Oh, Other than JFK, which I have a very faint recollections of his assassination. He's the first president I remember actually feeling an emotion towards passing away. So thank you for being with us. And I'd like to start by asking you, what are some of your earliest recollections of your grandfather? We're going to talk about your grandmother too. I'm not forgetting about Mamie, believe me, but what are some of your earliest recollections of your grandfather? Well, we're, we're going way back because I was six when he left office. So, but I, I remember that probably better than I, what I had for breakfast this morning. So I think there were several, you know, it's, it's hard to um, kind of pick and choose because there's several kind of fun, fun memories. And there's some very sentimental ones as well. I might say I was in school and we had property that abutted granddad's farm and so we saw each other every day after, especially after he got out of office. So I was in school one day and the kids started telling me things about my grandfather that I didn't think were true. You know, I, I didn't see how it was possible. Hmm. So that was back in the day when you could walk home from school without your parents getting arrested, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I walked to his house instead of my house. And he was always in the nap room at, at that particular time of day. He used to love to read Westerns. And 
I ran into his nap room and I said, Granddad, I have to know something about, you know, I need, I need to know if this is true or not. And he put his book on his chest and took his reading glasses off and he says, okay, what? And I said, is it true that your name is really David Dwight, not Dwight David? He said, oh yeah, well, there were so many Davids in the family. I got tired of being called Bud. So I took up Dwight and I said, oh, all right. Well, that makes sense. I said, is it, is it true that you were raised a, a Democrat? Oh. <laughs> and he said, oh, yes, the family was a uh, Democrat. And he said, as an army officer, we didn't vote for our commander in chief. So I did not claim a party while I was in the, in the army. I said, well, what, what made you go Republican then? And this is where I started regretting asking the question because I suddenly got into a civics course, right? He said, well, you know, the Democrats had been in power for so long. He felt like we needed a change. You know, he said, this is a two-party system. And between Roosevelt and Truman, you know, they sewn it up for about 30, 40 years or whatever. And um, I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. And he said that Taft was an isolationist and that was the leading Republican contender. And he knew from, you know, his experiences, war and all, all those things to go with it, that you can't be isolationist and survive in this world, period. You know, we're all countries of the world. And I said, oh, well, all that makes sense, but what if you'd lost? And he said, how's your weight coming along? <laughs> I said, never mind. He said, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, it was like, okay, that's the last time I draw back bloody nubs from him. <laughs> but it was an honest question, too. I mean, I really, you know, but what if you'd lost? <laughs> you know, it would have been terrible. Good questions, though. You were asking him. Those weren't just easy ones. Those are, you know, challenging. You were, you really wanted <laughs> to know the answers, didn't you? Well, when he got onto the two-party system thing, I went, oh, heck, I'm so yeah, sorry no, to ask him. I don't want to go to school. But um, another kind of fun one, the Marx Toy Company had given the grandchildren a Christmas present one year of a of an electric Thunderbird. It was probably about three feet high, you know, went half a mile an hour. It was like a golf cart. And it was to all four of us. And so, you know, we were organized into turns and, you know, David would drive first, then Ann, then Susie. And then when it came to my turn, we either had something else to do. You know, the youngest always, you know, I kind of get used to being second string if you catch my drift. We either had, had to go, we ran out of time, or my brother would drive me. And it never occurred to me that I was too small to be driving the thing or that, you know, I, they thought I was too young. And, you know, I was like, I don't get it. Why don't, why don't I get to get on the wheel? But I watched what my brother did, you know, like turning the keys and things like that. And one day the siblings were all out, you know, the sisters were at dance school and the brother was at a sports event. I don't know where mom and dad were, but, you know, that was back when the White House was actually the safest place a kid could be, you know didn't know eyes were on me, you know, and I could play by myself if I wanted to. And I, I was outside uh, around the diplomatic reception room area, you know, where they greet all the heads of state. And there the Thunderbird was parked under the tree. And I went, well, everybody else is gone. I've got time. It's my turn. So I went and got in the thing and the key was in the ignition. I knew, I knew how to do the ignition. Problem is I didn't know how to do the brake. I knew how oh. to knew how to accelerate, but I didn't know how to stop. And my driving skills were learned from Woody the Woodpecker, driving like, you know, with the moving hands and all that. Well, I stepped on it. And the next thing I knew, I was doing donuts in front of the diplomatic reception room. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this hand shows up. And there was a White House guard attached to the hand. But, you know, he said, uh, ma'am, you need to stop. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to stop. He says, take your foot off the accelerator, <laughs> you know, because he didn't want to explain about the pedal and all that. So I did, and I, uh, you know, came to, and uh, God, he was an old guy. He was about, you know, my dad's age. <laughs> and um, he said, I believe you were speeding. And my heart sank because there were two cardinal rules in our family. 
one, you didn't break the law, and two, you didn't lie. And I knew in order to avoid telling about the first one, I'd have to do the second one. <laughs> so I'm looking at him, I'm going, oh my gosh, I've just broken the law. And he wrote me a faux ticket. Oh my. Which, yeah. So I took the ticket and I just went straight up to my room, which is where they sent me when I was bad. You know, when I misbehaved or whatever, I always had to go to my room. So I just went up there, spent the rest of the afternoon there. And um, Dolores came, uh, Dolores being a wonderful lady that was actually working for my grandparents, but she was there when they were in the White House. And she came and got me ready for dinner. There was traditionally kind of a little social hour before dinner. And yeah, everybody was back. You know, the sisters were there. The brother was there. Parents were there. Mimi was there and granddad was not. And I thought, oh gosh, I wonder if granddad even knows about this, you know, because everybody else was acting like nothing ever happened. You know, to me, the world had just come to an end, <laughs> you know. I heard the elevator and that meant that granddad had come home from the office. And of course, I didn't, you know, I didn't connect that it. it was the Oval Office. It was just the office, right? Down the hall. And, yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I ran to the elevator and I thought, I'll tell him myself. And then that way, if I don't lie, you know, maybe he'll go a little easier on me or something like that. And I started, you know, kind of spitting out the story. And he got this kind of twisted look on his face. And he said, let me see if I have this straight. He said, you broke the law, but you didn't lie. And I'm thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, maybe I got brownie points. You're good. Um, he said, well, you still have to be punished. I went, oh. And he said, um, I don't think you can have a driver's license for at least another 11 years. <laughs> and I said, oh, man, why don't you just send me to my room? <laughs> yeah, wait a whole 11 years? <laughs> wait a whole 11 years. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> oh, man, what, a, what an experience to have to think that I'm just picturing it. You're playing in the White House as a kid. I mean, that is so neat. Now, you're a grandchild. So how much time did you spend actually visiting the White House? Uh, quite a bit because my father was on staff. He was uh, chief of security. So we would go and we would stay uh, weeks at a time, you know, and come home for a week or two or something and then go back. So I split my time between Gettysburg and, and Washington. When I was born, I was actually supposed to be born in the White House. They had a room all fixed up for me and everything else, but I was early. So I ended up at Walter Reed. Um, my mom and I did. And I was born in the same room granddad would die in 14 years later. Oh, I, I was just going to say, isn't that the hospital where your grandfather passed away? And But the same room? Same room. Yep. So I've always felt kind of a connection that way, too. <laughs> yeah. Now, you were also christened in the White House. Didn't I read that? I was in the blue room that Hillary Clinton turned yellow. <laughs> really? That is such a neat thing to think about. Now, when you were visiting the White House, where was your home? Where, did, where was your actual home at that time? Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was in Gettysburg, and your, your yeah. grandfather had a farm there as well, so it was adjoining yeah. property? Yes, it was. So these are some of your early memories when your grandfather was in the White House. So can you tell us about your relationship with your grandfather when he was no longer president? Maybe he was in, uh, in Gettysburg more. What was that like? Well, that was what was wonderful about him. He was he was a knee slapping grandfather. He, I didn't actually realize he was anything particularly special until I got into class and people started treating me like I had two heads. But he was very sensitive. You you'd think you know for somebody who had all the responsibility he did, he might have screened his own heart, mm. but he didn't. He was very he was very tender, and I had um, I was one of the 2% that contracted polio from the vaccine. Oh. Well, I'm very lucky because, you know, obviously I'm all in one piece. But what happened was I, I was unable to go out uh, while I was at home for a while. It was called an unidentified virus. They wouldn't name it polio until I was like much older. We had been the poster children kind of for the vaccines and that kind of thing. And so um, for the greater good, it just wasn't talked about. It resulted in, I, you know, I had a very high fever for a couple of weeks and I ended up, when I went back to school, I had to stay in for recess 
you know, I wasn't able to go out yet. And there was another little girl who couldn't go out for recess either. Her name was Letitia. So we started playing together inside. She had um, heart problems, but I, of course, wasn't aware of that. I knew that she had like a runny nose and things like that, but I didn't realize she was sick and sick, sick, you know, I was young. So when my restriction ended on the recess, I would fake anything I possibly could, sore throat, you know, stomach ache, anything to stay in with her. She didn't care that my name was Eisenhower. She didn't care about anything, but whose Barbie dolls we were going to be using and who got what outfit and, you know, that kind of thing. She was just very genuine and, and oblivious to the other things that, you know, it was a blessing and a curse. So we started carpooling together with her brother, Frederick. They didn't live very far away from us and we started carpooling to school. And she dropped out of the carpool, but she would wave to us from the living room window uh, without fail. I mean, you know, uh, so Frederick and I would go off to school. Anyway, uh, Frederick didn't carpool one day. It, it was her little brother. Uh, didn't carpool one day. And I went to his class asking where he was. My mom wouldn't tell me. <laughs> and um, the teacher must have missed her diplomatic lessons somewhere along the way. But she said, well, Letitia fell out of bed last night and died. Oh. Oh. And I mean, there was no lead up to it or anything. That's exactly how she said oh. it. To me. So I went into orbit and um, we had a memorial for her on that Friday. Her the Girl Scout troop and we sang white coral bells because that was her favorite flower. And to this day, you know, I don't know how many years later, I won't even say, I can't sing it, you know, unless I want to cry. <laughs> yeah, if you're in the mood for crying, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh, that must have been so traumatic for you. My mom would think that I wouldn't hear something, not knowing, you know, like I heard about a lot of granddad's heart attacks from the radio because, you know, she was trying to protect me and she wouldn't, you know, she didn't want me to worry. Anyway, so we're, uh, I was at the farm that Sunday and granddad was sitting in his favorite rocker watching Green Acres. And I was on a love seat on the porch, you know, which was where that was a family flop spot. And um, I was just staring out of the plate glass window and just staring. I was like, bah. And he actually turned off Green Acres, which is, I mean, it was really his favorite show. He got such a kick out of it. And he came over and sat down beside me on the sofa. Excuse me, I get a little emotional when I think about it. And, you know, everybody knew what happened. And he put his arm around me and he said you know he paraphrased a poem and I forget the name of the poem but he said you know she has not gone away she lives within you she lives within those fields that you play in she's all around you and I just put my head on his chest and I have never felt so loved and so secure as when I heard his heartbeat oh. and um, that's one I'll take to my grave with me what a beautiful memory when you think of, I mean, he was president of the United States before that. He was the supreme allied commander of the allied forces in Europe. I mean, and you had that moment and he interrupted Green Acres to boot. <laughs> yeah. He had two uh, pigs named Arnold. Oh, of course. I love <laughs> that show. Uh, Arnold but Ziffel. He, but he focused in on you. He saw you were hurting. And, and that is, it's a, it's hard. How old were you at this time? Do you... I was seven. Seven, yeah. So that was hard to digest all that and to feel his love and and uh, to hear his heartbeat. And you mentioned before that about him having a number of heart attacks. Uh, he had several, right, Mary Jane? He had, well, here's the weird part of the story. He had six massive heart attacks that he survived. The seventh one, it just stopped and they didn't revive him. But after he had been gone for 30 years, they declassified his medical records from during World War II. And he was living on a, a moving train. And it turned out that he was having, well, he was complaining about angina, mm -hmm. which is a chest pain. But he never took a break or anything like that. But he was having many heart attacks all the way through the war. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. He just, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't take a break. 
And his first massive one was uh, the October before I was born in 55. Mm. So interestingly, the doctor made reference to another 10 years or whatever. And his second one was 10 years to the day. And they were always right before his son's birthday, the one that died. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that as well, because I, I want to ask you about your grandma, Mamie. Yeah. You know, your grandfather was such a larger than life character, <laughs> but an amazing man in so many ways. But he had a huge support system behind him, right? Tell us about your grandma, Mamie Eisenhower. They were a team. There's no question about that. And they were utterly devoted to each other. In fact, I kind of blame them for setting the bar too high on marriage. <laughs> you know, here I am, <laughs> not married. Um, but he had so much responsibility as both an army officer and as president. And when he was president, Mamie had a staff of one. They have, what, 35 now? Mm. And she did all the event planning. She literally ran the White House and interestingly, that one employee that she had, granddad paid for out of his own pocket. Really? She, yeah. Of course, yeah. Times have changed. <laughs> uh, and when we would stay at the uh, White House, he, he would pay hotel rates for us. The only one he didn't for were me and him. So, I mean, you know, now now they use the rooms to fundraise, <laughs> you know, it's, so it's like a whole different, whole different mindset. But anyway, during the liberated times, you know, when they were trying to pass ERA and that kind of stuff, my grandmother said, well, you know, I don't, I don't really find it that necessary because I've always had all the career I ever needed in Ike. And I thought, oh, how, you know, June Cleaver of you, you know, let's clean the oven and our pearls. Okay. <laughs> but then I thought about it and the massive amount of work that she was doing at the White, she was a diplomat. She was a hostess. She planned all the events. She picked the flowers. She, you know, did all this different stuff. And she took care of my grandfather. He confided in her. And, you know, they were a real team. And I thought, no, she'd be making six figures, <laughs> you know, now. So she did have all the careers she needed to make. But she didn't have to have, she didn't have to have the front seat. She did a lot of work virtually undercover. She was very involved in the American Heart Foundation, not only because of my grandfather's heart, but because of her own. She had rheumatic fever when she was young, and so she had a rheumatic heart, and she took amazing care of herself, and people would comment because when she did her correspondence, she answered every letter that came to her attention. Um, you know, I think some were screened for the hate mail and things like that, and she would work from bed and she had all these beautiful bed jackets and matching ribbons in her hair and everything. She was always very prim and proper about it, but she would work from bed in the morning. She wouldn't get it, get out until almost lunchtime. And um, people were commenting about it. And one thing she told me, and I saw it for real, she said, etiquette is not something that, you know, it's not done to be snarky or snobby or anything like that. The idea is that somebody walks away feeling better when they leave you than when you came up to them. Yes. So she was very private about her health and uh, that kind of thing. And her comment to the people that would ask her were, you know, well, she pretended like she was just pampered. She would say, every lady ought to be able to stay in uh, bed until noon and all day, once a month at least. Oh, that is, that is so cool. So when your grandparents met your grandfather was a young army officer at the time. How did they meet? Well, Mamie's family was, they were snowbirds from Denver and they had a, a winter home in San Antonio, Texas. And granddad was stationed at Fort Sam Houston. And there was a mixer late in the year, I believe it was in December that they met at, but it was like an instant attraction. They were like you know, going on walks, which was, you know, daring back in those days. Oh, yeah. They were going on walks and doing all kinds of stuff right off the bat. You know, it's just kind of a love at first sight, especially she was the one that was really vocal about that, but she just adored him. And they got engaged the following 
Valentine's Day and they were worried about World War I, that he might have to deploy. So they married by July. And my great grandmother, Mamie's mother, who she was very close to, I might add, but uh, she just had a case of the vapors. She said, this is all going too fast. It doesn't look right. you know. <laughs> uh, so they had a, a nice small ceremony at the Dowd's living room home in Denver. Mm-hmm. They never had the big socialite wedding. So on their 50th anniversary, Mimi treated that like the huge wedding that she didn't get. Wow. And it was just beautiful. And she had this beautiful gold brocade dress that she wore and it was a beautiful occasion you attended and, that you were at that uh 50th oh, oh yeah wow so i was like an experience so where was it held it was held at my parents home and uh my parents had five acres in valley forge at that point and it was just beautiful what all they did for it and there, there were two things of that that later on told me how much it meant to her she uh she told me, she and I became very close when I was working on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. Dating for an assortment of reasons was not fun. <laughs> uh, the ratios were not good. So I, I, you know, Gettysburg's an hour and 15. So I, I would spend most Saturdays and Saturday night and then Sunday go to church and then come home with her. And I, I was so blessed to have her at that time. But she told me, during that time, I mean, we, we'd solve the world problems, including the family problems and everything else. We, we just, course. yeah, of course. <laughs> and she said that she wanted to be buried in her golden wedding anniversary dress. Mm. And she said, make sure it happens. Just tell somebody or make sure it happens. She said, it's in my records, but I just, you know, and she mentioned it more than once. I mean, she'd say it all the time. It was interesting too, because, you know, she never really stopped mourning granddad. She was very Chrissy um, about her house, you know, it had to be perfect. But that favorite chair that I mentioned to you uh, was a rocker that had come down her side of the family. It was velvet. And he'd sat on it so much that the velveteen was worn, but she wouldn't have it recovered because she considered that to be his thumbprint and she, she didn't want to get rid of it, uh, rid of that fabric. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. And uh, how many years did, Mamie outlive Ike. Well, he died in 69 and she died in 79, but um, she was a little bit later on in the year than him. Mm. So I'd say, you know, 10 and a half, 11 years. But, you know, what was interesting, she had a stroke again near her son's birthday, uh, my father's brother, and it sent her to Walter Reed. You know, of course, the family flocked and then I, I stayed on. I just had a massive miscarriage, a big, a, you know, a big one. I'm uh, sorry. And so, well, I had time off from work <laughs> as yeah. a result. I stayed with her at Walter Reed. They put a recliner in the room and the whole bit. And when I was going through some of her things and trying to organize her a little bit, there was the golden wedding anniversary dress. She had grabbed it before she left Gettysburg. Um. So, uh, you know, yeah, it was all about, all about uh, him. Oh, that's, that's beautiful to, to get. I remember when she passed away, I remember that Bet, both Bess Truman and your grandmother both lived quite a bit longer, I think, after their husbands. I, I don't remember how long Bess was, but I think she lived to be like 90, late 90s or something. Yeah, wasn't she 1985? She actually outlived your grandmother. So, yeah. And she was older. Bess Trimmer yeah. was older. You mentioned about your father's brother. So let's let's just go back about the the tragedy that uh, your grandparents had when they lost their son. Could you tell that story a little? Sure. Granddad was doing a lot of they. You know, they were new virtual newlyweds. I think a couple of years, and he was doing a lot of temporary duty (TDY) they call it. Mm-hmm. And you know, he'd be gone for weeks at a time and. This is after Ike was born. It started out as Ike, and then he became a toddler and started having runny noses and all that stuff, and it turned into Icky. Icky. <laughs> what a great nickname. Yeah. People always say, why Icky? You know, well, he was a toddler, you know. But anyway, so they wanted to kind of take a second honeymoon, or, or maybe it was their first, I don't know. And she was going to accompany him with one of his TDYs. 
and they interviewed uh, several, what, nannies or nursemaids or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call them. And one of the contingencies was, have you been exposed to any contagious diseases? And none of them had really. And so they picked the one that they, she picked the one that they liked. And she had been exposed to scarlet fever and not divulged it. Um, Icky caught it from her. I think she was just a carrier. I'm not, I'm not sure that, but she'd been exposed and he got it from her. And sadly, he lived a couple of weeks with it. So everybody was, you know, sitting on pins and needles and they wouldn't let my grandmother in to see him in the hospital, I guess, because he was contagious and she had the rheumatic heart and that kind of thing. Uh, But granddad could go in and he ended up dying in granddad's arms. Oh, obviously it's devastating, but uh, how did each one of them deal with that? Do you have any idea about that? Well, every year on his birthday while he was alive, granddad sent Mamie yellow roses on his birthday. And, um, you know, they, they didn't talk about it a lot, but one time the, the press asked him, you know, he was doing an interview of some kind or, and they said of all the experiences you've had, what would you consider to be the most complex or difficult? And you'd think with world war two and the presidency and, uh, growing, and growing up dirt poor in uh, happily in Kansas and, you know, all kinds of, uh, shall we say, run-ins in his life. But without skipping a beat, he said, the loss of my son, things are never the same. Of course. And he and my father actually ended up extremely close, probably in part as a result of that. I mean, when daddy graduated West Point on D-Day, and he looked so much like my grandfather, if he wanted an independent career choice, he probably should have made a different one than that. But uh, anyway, when daddy graduated, they traditionally get a, a month's leave before they have to report for duty after graduation. And daddy was called to the commandant's office and he was told what his father was doing that day. And he got sent straight over to England to be with his father as his aide. So he never really got his break. Wow. So this is right at, on D day, he graduated and then he went right over to Europe. Right over to England. Yep. Great uh, segue there, because I wanted to ask you about your dad. I When I started to prep for meeting you and interviewing you, I thought, let me look through YouTube and see what I can find. And I thought, oh, here's a, uh, an interview with John Eisenhower, the yeah. son of Dwight and Mamie. And I have since watched two video interviews. First of all, he interviewed so well so well but i found that this man was so interesting and so genuine and was such a rich storyteller and sincere (laughs) and he met he met stalin he met uh i think he met montgomery he met churchill he met all these people of course his father was you know the highest ranking officer in in europe And he just told these stories so casually. And one of the things I I picked up on him that I was so humble because he said, you know, at at some points I was, it was like two worlds. I was, you know, meeting these famous people, but then I was back, you know, with the rest of the, (laughs) the infantry. Normal life. Yeah. Normal life. He had to keep doing that. But I I climbed on Charles de Gaulle's lap when he was visiting the farm. (laughs) Yes. I, yeah, I've been I've been doing some research, and I heard you speak about that. Tell me before we get back to your dad, because I really want to talk about him because he's yeah, oh yeah, what a story. What a story for him. But other than the fact that your grand, you know, your grandfather was president of the United States and a military leader, who what other people? You said you met Charles de Gaulle. Were there other famous <laughs> people that you met? Well, uh, Khrushchev, and that actually ended up changing my life later which is kind of an interesting, all my life's a circle. And then um, King of Pakistan, whose wife promised me a, a native costume that never showed up. Uh, lost in the mail. <laughs> yeah, it was lost in the mail. Might have been, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, or maybe it didn't make customs and I just didn't know. <laughs> you mentioned you sat on Charles de Gaulle's lap. Well, one thing granddad would do is 
he would take heads of states to the farm once it was completed so that they'd see something other than D.C., New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles as the United States. And um, he'd take them, he'd, he'd compare cows with them and things like that. He, he was uh, a gentleman farmer, but an active farmer. And he raised Black Angus and that kind of thing. There's great pictures of him with the King of Pakistan comparing cows. <laughs> but um, that might be why Green Acres was his favorite show. I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah. So our houses were probably a mile apart from each other, but the properties abutted. And there was like a, a little lane that would go between the two of them. So when De Gaulle came, they came over to... Um, our house for the social hour. And then, you know, everybody went back to the farm for dinner and De Gaulle had like a translator security and you know, his wife was, wasn't there. And then there, there was Mimi and granddad. And then, you know, the secret service were always good about being in a different room, but not, not so much De Gaulle's security. Then there were the two sisters and, and the brother and the parents. Our house just wasn't, that, you know, the living area just wasn't that big. And I came in and there was no seat for me. And I looked around the room and I saw one of granddad's old buddies and climbed into his lap. It was Charles de Gaulle. And they were speaking in French. He, he wouldn't speak English, right? So there's uh, speaking in French with interpreters. Those were some of the extra people too. There were two interpreters. I guess one checks the other. And um, granddad, uh, in the middle of all of it, pulled out a document for him to read. And he pulls these, I have yet to see since or before, cup bottle glasses, red horned rimmed. And he puts them on his face, looks at the document, takes his glasses off and hands it back to granddad. And in my diplomatic little way, I looked at him and I said, why are your glasses so thick? You know, nobody thought he spoke English. So, you know, and he answered, because I cannot see poor, poor me. Oh, he could speak English then, huh? <laughs> uh -huh nice. been silent. Everybody's kind of, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned Khrushchev. You actually met him. I did. So when Khrushchev came to the United States, it was the same, it was the infamous year of the, the, the UN where he pounded his shoe on the podium yeah. while he was kind of, uttering explicatives to, to those who would listen. And um, so he, granddad brought him to the farm too. And this time we were all at the farm instead of, you know, splitting it between the two houses. And they put us in the, in the living room, which that was usually the Christmas room because, you know, we stayed out of there as a rule. And the family flop spot, like I mentioned before, was the porch. So he took Khrushchev and, somebody with him out there and then um my dad and granddad went out and there were french doors that closed it off to the uh living room and they closed the french doors and they're all in, in there talking khrushchev meanwhile had had brought us some gifts he he brought my brother a, a kennedy coloring book which we all kind of went er who's john kennedy you know at that point we didn't know who he was and then um he gave the girls nest dolls, you know, the Russian nest dolls that they have. I still have mine. And he also gave us four Soviet lapel pins, which we immediately put on. And, you know, we were enjoying playing with all of them. And all of a sudden, Grandad, and of course, I'd never seen Grandad mad. I was the baby. Uh, I was little. And, you know, he was, I've already described that one gentle side to him. Uh -huh. uh, so I'd never really seen him angry because I didn't go to the office with him, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Down the hall, right? So granddad blew through the French doors and he collected all the stuff. He didn't notice the lapel pins, I don't think. But he collected all the stuff and he kind of shoved it at Khrushchev. And it was scary. I, I mean, as far as he said something on the porch that really bothered my grandfather, obviously. And um, anyway, so we were on our way back to the other house. My mom and dad were talking about what was said on the porch. And I've always been fairly sensitive to saying what it was because, you know, 
it might be embarrassing to a Soviet person, mm -hmm. you know, or Russian or whatever. And uh, out of the corner of her eye, my mother saw the lapel pin on me and she sticks her hand out and collected all the lapel pins and threw them into the cow pasture. So if there's ever an archaeological dig in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, those lapel pins, that's where they came from. <laughs> That'd be tough to interpret that history when they dig that up, right? What was this about? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I just remember being terribly frightened of him, you know, because he made my grandfather mad. And then, of course, you know, hearing what he actually said, I mean, I, I guess they were so, the parents were shook up too, and they, they weren't protecting us at that point. So if you fast forward to 1996, People to People International was having, I was married uh, to Ralph and we worked together at an engineering firm. He was the engineer, I was the administrator. And um, People to People contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to speak at their worldwide conference mm -hmm. in Newport, California. And, you know, of course it's an international organization and there, there's a theme every year. And that year, the Russians were beginning to travel the U.S. a lot. So there were like 50, you know, they said they wanted to hear about the heart and soul of people to people. And I thought, well, that means they want granddad stories. And I remember when daddy and granddad were working to put people to people into the private sector from the government. And I remembered how passionate granddad was about that. And, you know, so it, it all seemed like it was fine. And I said, I'd be glad to. And the night before I was supposed to speak, one of the trustees grabbed me by the arm and said, Mary Jean, there's somebody here you have to meet. And I saw him from a distance and he looked just like his father. It was Sergei Khrushchev. Oh. My heart went down to my feet. And, you know, people to people is all about understanding, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, my, my heart went down to my feet. And if I wasn't taught anything, I was taught to be polite. So I did extend my hand to him, and all I could think of, what was this organization that my grandfather founded and was cherished doing, putting me you know, on the podium with this guy? Right. And um, when I shook his hand, he pulled me close to him, and he said, my dear, I hope you're not as uncomfortable as I am. And I thought, I didn't know what it meant, but it tickled me, so I, I laughed. And then we started talking, and we were telling corny jokes on both sides, you know, Russian ones and U.S. ones. And I had a blast. Uh, about 45 minutes later, I walked away and thumped my forehead and said, that's why people to people put us together. And I was so smitten and bitten by the bug that I went home to Ralph and resigned and dedicated my life to people to people. It ended up in 25 years of full-time people to people. Tremendous. And I was going to mention that. I was going to ask you about that, but you've told a great story about how it came about. What a what a wonderful humanitarian unifying cause uh, people to people has been throughout the years. And thank you oh. for your service in that. Oh, it was my life. You know, I, uh, Ralph and I divorced. That's not why, but I guess I, ma I married I married the organization, basically. And the thing that just blew me away was the son of my grandfather's biggest adversary, you know, changed my life forever. Just that one meeting. So you fast forward again to, um, I guess it was 2000, I think 17. And I'm involved with, as you know, the, the Cherry Blossom Festival. And Nicholas, he knew the Khrushchev story. And he called me and he said, hey, have you had any contact? You know, he's, he's a great connector with Sergei Khrushchev. And I said, not since, not since, although I, I would love to tell him what he did for me because he, he was a pivotal part in my life. And he said, well, if I can get him for the Cherry Blossom Festival, would you be willing to interview him? I said, well, it's been 21 years. I would be delighted. I said, I've never had a chance to tell him or thank him for what he actually did for me. And anyway, Nicholas somehow, some way made it happen. Sergei Khrushchev went to Marshfield, Missouri, and he was a great interview. Two questions and I was done. <laughs> but um, before the interview, I, I wanted to 
make sure that that it was all comfortable for him. So I said, is there, you know, we were eating, we stayed in the same bed and breakfast. We were eating breakfast and it was downstairs. And I said, is there anything you want me to stay away from? He says, uh, ask me anything. And so I mentioned, I said, do you remember going to the people to people event in Newport beach, California? This is 21 years later. He says, of course I do. And I said, you know, I was really taken aback that you were there. And he said, well, it's a, it's a scary thought for a little girl to hear that she might be buried alive. And I thought, now, how did he know that? Because I was very careful not to, political, not physical statement, but, you know, I was very careful not to ever repeat that. And I said, yeah. And I said, well, I have a, a crystal globe with people to people on it that I want to give to you. May I give it to you at your interview? And he said, well, that's very flattering, you know, and I told him the whole thing that I quit my job and the whole bit. And he said, well, he said, yes, I, I could. And he was going up to, to finish getting ready. And I was going to get another cup of coffee. There was a huge urn next to the staircase, right? And as he's going up the stairs, he gives me this smile that just knock your eyeballs out. And I missed my coffee cup altogether and got coffee all over my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Life's dignified moments. So... Uh -huh. We went to the interview and, you know, I gave him the globe and all that. And when we came back, he said, you know, he was early 80s and he you know, he wanted to take a nap. He was very fit, I might add. He, he was a speed walker at 80 something. So he goes in to take his nap. And I was in one of the, you know, the mutual living area of the bed and breakfast. And I saw a book that obviously was there for him to sign or something. Khrushchev on Khrushchev. And I thought, oh, he wrote another book. And I picked it up and I turned it over and there was a young Sergei with his father. And I went, oh my God, that's how he knew he was the one on the porch. Okay. And his little, like in 96, when he said, uh, I hope you're not as uncomfortable as I am. You know, those were his little ways of apologizing. How nice. What a great story, Mary Jean. That is so, so interesting and touching. I feel very fortunate to have been able to talk to him about it because he did pass away the next year. Yeah. Yeah. I so. did hear about that too, but uh, you've had such an interesting life with the people that you've run into. I just wanted to just go back to your dad for a second. Your dad looks just like his father. He even mentioned in the interview that he said it was like wearing a Dwight Eisenhower mask and walking around with <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower mask on, except he was taller how were their personalities similar and how were they different? The one thing they had in common was a pivotal part of their personalities. Everybody else came first. And if they loved you, they were devoted. I think granddad was more at ease with people than daddy was. Daddy was a little more shy. He mm -hmm. had to learn how to be social. I mean, growing up in a shadow like that, it's it's difficult. I Oh, yeah. There were two things in particular that I remember that Daddy said that only a son of a very powerful person could say. When he was ambassador to Belgium, of course, I was the only kid that went with him because I was the only one left at home. And one evening he was pacing around. They had an event they had to go to, and he's in his tux, and he's kind of red and sweating and all that stuff. And I accused him of meeting his demons because he hated tuxes. You know? And I said, are you all right? And he says, well, I just have to go to another blankety blank cocktail party where a bunch of blankety blank old women are going to tell me how much I look just like Ike. <laughs> and I was, okay, I get it. And I do remember one time he got really frustrated over something and it, it wasn't because of my grandfather. It was because of how people reacted to him. You know, he felt like he was in a zoo and we were in Normandy. We were doing kind of a footsteps tour and we went into the Normandy museum and we were with a people to people delegation and daddy agreed to come on it with me. And of course there's wall sized pictures of granddad in the Normandy museum, you know, huge. Mm -hmm. And so I think daddy got a little uncomfortable, you know, who knows what he went through, you know, through all that time. He was like my grandmother in that sense that he wouldn't tell you what was wrong with him. He wanted to hear all about you. So he, <laughs> He stepped outside to take a break, and I decided to follow him because I wanted to make sure he was all right. Daddy and Mimi were my favorite people on earth. I mean, you know, just loved them both. And so we're standing there, 
and what what appears to be a veteran, and I would say probably from Wales, judging from his accent, he came up and he says, sir, has anybody ever told you you look just like Ike? And daddy got kind of cagey and he said, well, I've heard it a time or two. And I'm like, obviously this means something to him, just fess up, you know. And um, he said, no, no, you look more like the man than the man. And daddy said, yes, I've been told. And I said, daddy, just tell him. And he said, all right, I'm John Eisenhower. And the guy went berserk. And daddy did, you know, he got a little short with him, cringeworthy short. And I thought, oh, dear, you know, if he didn't want to say, I shouldn't have, you know, asked him to. So I went back to the group and daddy just wanted to go on a walk. You know, he just, he wanted to be by himself, which that was fine. I knew him like a book. I mean, you know, that was just what he needed to do for him. And um, so I go inside and I come back out with the group and there's daddy on the beach with the same man and they're having a wonderful time. Oh, it worked out okay. It did, yeah. So you you lost your dad, what, about 10 years ago? Yeah, it's 10 years ago. Um, it was in December. He died 13. No, it's this December. It's 10 years. He became a brigadier general. He graduated from West Point. He was an ambassador to Belgium. He was an historian, an author, just a, a really tremendous, impactful man. And he had four children. You're one of four. You mentioned you're the youngest. I think you told me on a previous call that you lost your sister last year. Yeah, she she died in July. We had a memorial for her in October. That was a sudden death. That was She had been out to dinner, and she was getting ready for bed, and boom. I'm so sorry. but That's a sad loss. I know you're a very close family, but I've just thoroughly enjoyed this uh, discussion with you, Mary Jean. You are just a tremendous lady. I know that you are out speaking about your heritage and your your grandparents, and I know you have a deep love for your dad, and uh, it's so apparent the way you talk about him. And I want to thank you. You've just been a wonderful guest, and I hope we can stay in touch and see what else you're doing, and uh, we'll be uh, see if you'll be at the Cherry Blossom Festival again. Maybe I can get out there next year. Oh, that would be fun. In <laughs> fact, love I, that. I am officially inviting you right now. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary Jean. Keep up the good work, and I hope you have a wonderful evening and a great summer. Well, and you too. You too. And and do keep in touch. You're a great ambassador to the American people for your family heritage and for American history in general, and for all the work that you did with people to people as well, bringing people together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. God bless. God bless you too. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.